Welcome in to Conversations, and thank you for joining us. I'm Rusty Ray. We try to take an opportunity to talk to different people about things that are going on, perhaps making news, or in this case, the time of year. It's back to school time. So we welcomed in our superintendents across the North Metro, and we're happy to be joined today by the superintendent of Centennial Schools, Jeff Holmberg. Jeff, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. How's your summer? And it's gone very well and very quickly. Very, very. It's always the case, it's right? It's always the you case. You think, well, we have about two weeks left, but then it's like, oh, we only have two weeks left. Yeah. <laughs> it, every summer is very busy in a school district, so. And especially this time of year, getting ready for a new school year. And, and speaking of that, the past, last time when we talked last year, yeah. COVID was still kind of lingering and there was really an impact in terms of mitigation, yeah. uh, in terms of people missing work or being out of school. How is COVID affecting how your school district is approaching this year? Yeah, last summer, a year ago, we were in a very different place. Mm -hmm. um, certainly mitigation strategies, a new a variant. Uh, there were still a lot of questions, and of course, a lot of our families and staff had a lot of questions as well. Um, concern and, and just trying, again, the focus of having a safe school year and keeping, keeping people safe. And that part is always the case, you know, focus on school safety. And, uh, but we're, a year later, we are in a very different place. Um, you know, navigating the pandemic last year, we still had its challenges. It's challenges for our families and our students and also our staff. Um, you know, we weren't immune to those. Um, but that, part of that was working through and continuing to focus on kids. And, and our staff did amazing things, did amazing things to, to really help us navigate last year, help students navigate um, you know, the pandemic and, and, and be a resource to families. And thankfully, we're in a different place. Um, you know, most of the information from, from the CDC and MDH uh, has shifted a bit. It's a lot of mitigation strategies in terms of um, uh, hygiene, making sure that we're doing our cleanliness strategies and things that we're all implementing. And it's also, uh, you know, largely, if you're not feeling well, stay home. You know, if you feel you have COVID or you, you, you have symptoms, please test, you know, and, and, and take the right course of action if you test positive, you know, either consulting with your physician, staying home for five days, uh, you know, and then coming back when you're well and the symptoms subside. So, uh, you know, that's the, that's the piece that we're communicating with families as well. We're not requiring masks on buses or in schools, uh, but if families and students feel more comfortable wearing masks and uh, in schools or on buses, they're more than welcome to do so, and we're going to support them in that. Is it my understanding that there will be some reporting of numbers is it still once a week, and that's to a state kind of clearinghouse yes. of that information? So we still do track the numbers, but the, the re reporting requirements are different. Okay. It is more of a uh, ongoing tracking for the number of students and staff that we are, that are uh, testing positive that, that we track. In past few years, we've had a dashboard. Mm -hmm. um, that requirement's not there anymore, so we're not going to be having a dashboard where we go through a weekly component as that's not required. Um, but we do have to continue reporting uh, COVID positivity rates you know, that, that are happening in our schools. Um, any concerns or questions still popping up from either families or from staff about that situation? Or are you doing the best you can to communicate all of that right now? So our communication strategies, we, you know, we still have our return, you know, safe return to school plan, so there's requirements for that. We're also re communicating with our families about the start of the school year, what's different, what they can expect. Uh, but we're in a vastly different place this year. Last year, there, there were a lot of families reaching out with questions and concerns, and, and that hasn't been the case this year. Um, I think in the spring last year, as we were wrapping up the school year, we had a lot of traditional return to uh, normal activities, I guess normal activities, mm -hmm. where uh, we had parents and families at events, things that were happening. We had our traditional graduation. Over the summer, we've had you know, a lot of things that are happening as well in our schools with kids club and, and camps and activities and community education classes. And you know, we've had no concerns uh, come up there or people overly anxious with that. And as we prepare for the start of the year, uh, we've really had very little mm -hmm. uh, feedback or concern about our, our mitigation strategies or COVID in general. Finally about COVID, I promise, last question yeah. about COVID. It, it, are there plans in place or are there things that the district can pivot to should it need that have been tested and tried already? And you, you went through the, all of that the last couple of three years. Are there systems or plans, like I say, contingencies to yeah. go to should whatever the case may be need to pivot to that? Absolutely. I, I think over the, what the last three years or two years have taught us is that we have to pivot when 
you know, things are happening that are beyond our control. And we have to, to make those decisions in the best interest of our families and our students and our staff. And so we have contingency plans. Um, you know, we certainly have, we've uh, went through a lot of conversations, planning and discussion over the last several years. You know, none of those plans are going away. We certainly are not anticipating that we're gonna have to use them. Mm -hmm. um, but also too, you know, as we start seeing some of those things that are happening with, um, you know, for, with staffing, you know, we have contingency plans in mm -hmm. place for that as well. If we start having a, a number of staff that are out sick so that we can continue to provide that educational experience for kids. Let's talk about staffing. Where, uh, where is the district right now in terms of are there many open positions, uh, are hiring? How's that gone? Have you seen smaller candidate pools? A lot of people we talk to, not yeah. just in education, from police chiefs all the way mm -hmm. to people who own restaurants talking about they're just not getting as many applicants for a lot of reasons. Where, yeah. Where's staffing right now? So yesterday we opened up new staff workshop and welcomed 63 new teachers okay. to Centennial. And uh, that started long before yesterday. Mm -hmm. So um, back in the last winter, you know, we started looking at just projected enrollment as well as, you know, staff that were anticipating or projecting a retirement. And we really kicked off our recruiting and our, and our hiring efforts late in the winter, early spring. Um, we participate in the, a job fair that's hosted by colleges and universities of Minnesota, where we were able to, where we were able to meet candidates, um, do on-site interviews, and we were also able to make some offers you know, for projected openings mm -hmm. that we had. And then we continued to you know, communicate and, and uh, recruit through all the different avenues that are out there, our website. Uh, we even had billboards on 35W up for a while that we were hiring. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say too that one of our biggest strategies that we found with success is our principals and our administrators reaching out to their parent groups or, or um, their colleagues or neighbors saying, hey, if, you know, we're looking for teachers, we're looking for paraprofessionals, and we've also done a lot of word of mouth recruiting as well, which has been very successful for us. So right now at this point, we have three staff openings. Um, uh, they, one is a school psychologist, another one's a nursing position. Um, those are typically very hard to find. Uh, however, our contingency fan, plan is, is that we have out, we'll contract with outside mm -hmm. agencies so we're able to uh, successfully um, perform those functions for our students. Uh, we do anticipate we're watching our student enrollment. So as I mentioned, we had retirements. We have had some resignations, mm -hmm. but we've also had um, some positive student enrollment growth. And so that's led us to more hiring. And then our school board approved a commitment to reduce class sizes. So we also right. have FTE devoted to class size reduction as well. And so it's not just replacing teachers, but it's also bringing in new teachers to meet the, the community and the students that are coming to our school. So our staff has, our, our HR department, our principals, our staff have done a tremendous job doing all that they can to prepare and recruit, hire, interview, offer, hire, uh, you know, and then now it's onboarding so that when people are coming into Centennial, they feel confident and successful as they start the school year and then also supported through the school year. But burnout is real. Burnout is a thing with teachers. Yeah. I know this personally. I'm married to a teacher and it's yeah. tough and, it, and they've been stretched yeah. beyond what maybe they even or maybe even administrators in your position or principals thought possible because of all of the above. And how in tune are you with that? Are you seeing, hearing, are you discussing at higher levels? How can we, how can we best support this? You mentioned yeah. support just a, a second ago, but what does that look like? What does that mean on a district level? That, you know, number one, you have to be in tune with that. You have to keep the conversations mm -hmm. open so that you understand where people are at and also understand how you can meet them and, mm -hmm. and see what it is that they need. Uh, we spent a particular uh, amount of time this spring and summer talking about our onboarding process with staff, but also our professional development support of staff too. Um, professional development, you know, when you're talking teaching pedagogy, uh, you certainly we have a strong component in that. What we heard, and I, last year we talked about, going, we were going through a strategic planning process. One of the things we heard is how do we support staff on the social emotional side? How do we connect with staff? How do we, you know, really help them develop you know, connection to the district, connection with their colleagues, um, you know, where they have that support 
and we really meet them where they're at as a staff member. And that's, you know, it's pretty hard to do in COVID when you're right. sort of isolated and right. separated. And so I think that's one of the things we're also looking forward to is opportunities to bring people back together to build those connections, you know, reconnect those relationships. And also, you know, again, moving towards a more normal start to the school year, but also recognizing that teachers may still be in a very a, a different spot mm -hmm. where they need additional support in ways that maybe they, they weren't able to articulate six months ago, but they're able to articulate now. And then how do we hear that, understand that, and then how do we move forward with addressing that as we move forward? So mm -hmm. there's one other item too is on, that's you know our certified staffing part. On our um, paraprofessional side of thing, we do have more needs in that area. Uh, we have approximately 18 openings right now in paraprofessionals. Right. Um, and then, um, but we have offers going out today. And, and as we move forward, we're gonna continue to, to secure commitments in those areas. Uh, but we're doing very well in our buildings and grounds area with a couple openings, mm -hmm. food service. Uh, kids, cl kids Club, which is our mm -hmm. before and after school care as well. And so obviously if you're sitting at home watching this and uh, you're looking for a great place to work, please reach out. I mean, Centennial is a wonderful place and you know, we're gonna do what we can to, to round these out so our, our, our students have that support throughout the course of the year. Well, yeah, like those paras, that's a, that could be a good entry level or, or a good introduction to someone who may be interested in a career in education. And, you know, it's you don't have to have certain things. Yeah. You can you can already be in the classroom and be involved, especially with the younger kids, right? Yes. The paraprofessionals for the younger kids. Right? We also have paraprofessionals mm -hmm. at, at our secondary sites right. as well, but that's a great point. It's also not just an entry level into a paraprofessional or into a school district, but if people have advanced degrees, mm -hmm. we can also look at out of field licensure opportunities mm -hmm. for for community members or parents to come in and be teachers. And so there's avenues and opportunities there, depending on your advanced degrees and, and the amount of education you've received beyond high school. So we've also had to tap into that as well with some of our positions heading into this upcoming school year. Uh, we're headed into an election uh, that involves uh, spots on the Centennial School Board. And I would say from our perch, the school board races in our area and across the country are some of the most partisan, even though they're not partisan races. Correct. They're really, really, bitter races in some cases. And that speaks to me about more parent concern, more parent activism, that's a, mm -hmm. that's a tough one, or parent involvement in what is happening in classrooms. There, there are folks who have ideas about what they think is happening in classrooms versus what may actually be happening. You all are professional educators. You all went to school for this. You all, the pedagogy and all of that you mentioned, <coughs> Parent involvement, I think there can, be, there can be some good that comes from all of this if you can cut through the noise. Are you yeah. seeing some of that? Are you, what are you hearing outside of school board meetings where people might show up and rail at, at, uh, at you and others? Are you hearing on a day-to-day -day or an individual basis from parents? What we're hearing and what we heard last year is, is um, after a couple of years where we have not had visitors mm -hmm. or parents coming in to volunteer mm -hmm. or participate in schools like in traditional ways that they used to, uh, pe parents are thirsty for that. They want those opportunities back. And, and that's what we're really looking forward to. And one of the big differences as we start the school year is we're gonna be opening up those parent involvement and participation and volunteer opportunities again in our schools. Because number one, we know a couple things. When parents are involved and connected in our schools, kids do better. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's number one. The other thing too is, is that it strengthens that bond between school and community. And I think when you have parents that are there helping kids, supporting teachers, you know, doing those things that, that help teachers out and our mm -hmm. staff out, it, number one, it solidifies and also clarifies a lot of the, the misperceptions that may be out there. And so I, I, over the last couple of years, when schools have not allowed a lot of people into school districts, it's hard to come around with a narrative where there's a perception that something's happening that may not be true or something that's part, partially true. And so it is difficult. And I think we've had parents that call and say, hey, we hear this is happening. Is this true? Is this, you know, so a lot of conversations have been had over the last several years where, you know, it's like, no, this, this is not happening or yes, this has happened, but this is how we got to this point. 
And so there's definitely been more conversation about some of the things right. happening in schools and people just wanting a better understanding or awareness of, of the experiences that their kids are having in schools. And so I, what I think too is as we go into this new school year and we have opportunities for families to engage and come back into our schools, we're number one, better for kids. It's also going to um, be really one of our best communication mm -hmm. and relationship pieces because that's what we want as school districts. We want parents engaged. We want parents in our schools. We want them really talking about the things that are happening for our students. Um, on the, on, I think also too on the political side of things, we do have school board seats that are up. Um, we have candidates that are pursuing those seats. And I think too, when you have engagement and, you want pe and people are interested in pursuing a public office, that's a great calling. And I want to do whatever I can to support people in that and understanding that we want a school district that represent, that's proud, that we're proud of, of our, that's a community that's proud of our school district and that we're going to continue to do things that make them proud and establish deeper connections with the community so we have a better program for our kids. And so um, as we move forward in this elect, you know, electoral season, um, you know, our biggest thing is making sure we talk about the things that are happening in our schools, the things that we're doing for students. Uh, the great things that our staff are doing and, and how they're doing amazing things for our kids. They, didn't, they don't just do amazing things during a pandemic. Teachers and our staff um, across the district have done amazing things for many years for many students that have impacted kids on every level. So, uh, You're coming off of your first full year last yeah. year with Centennial. What was the biggest thing that you learned last year in doing the job and, and within the district from your seat? Uh, I, I would say last year coming into a brand new district <clears throat> where the only, it felt like the only thing that was new was me. And so coming in and you're meeting people, it's like everybody's new. Uh, you're trying to understand the relationships between, you know, the buildings, the administrators, people are trying to get to know me. And so it, in some ways it, it was trying, to, it was going slow to go fast. And I think what was really probably the biggest, um, I would say benefit as a new superintendent coming in is doing a strategic planning process right. where, you know, I mean, that's not all superintendents when they come into a school district have the opportunity to do that. And so I'm incredibly appreciative because that gave me the opportunity to have focus mm -hmm. groups, surveys, um, you know, staff giving input, focus group teams, planning teams come together to say, hey, you know, here's the history of Centennial. These are the things that we really love about our school district. These are the things that, you know, this is how we're connected to Centennial and why this is an important place for us. And these are the things we want to continue. And also, aspirationally, as we look to the next five to 10 years, these are things that we want to see happen in Centennial so that we continue to have experiences for kids. So it's a tremendous learning experience for me to hear that firsthand. And I think that's, that's the biggest part coming out of that is with, hearing that and having that context to a strategic plan, now it's implementing. It's, it's doing the action steps so that, that that strategic plan comes to life. And that's what I'm looking forward to this year and deepening relationships and connections with our community. And, and really, you know, the same people that came out to give feedback, we need to continue to engage with the implementation of new programs or or new, new things that are, mm -hmm. are gonna be for our kids moving forward because it collectively takes all of us to make that come to life. That was gonna be my last question. What are you specifically looking forward to for the, for the new school year? That, that's what you mentioned. Is there anything yeah. else that you kind of have your sights on or it's on the calendar or, or just kind of conceptually that you're looking forward to for this school year? Uh, you know, it, there's st it's, in some ways there's still a year of first. So uh, next week we have fall, we kick off fall mm -hmm. workshop and we're bringing back a all district meeting. You know, it's called convocation where we do a short welcome right. um, for our staff. Uh, you know, the band plays, choir sings. Uh, we have student council that's moderating. I'll say a few words. You know, our school board will be there, and we're really just looking for a way to bring people back to you know, number one, be back in the same room after several years of not being able to do that, mm -hmm. to be able to again reconnect to be able to really talk about what we're looking forward to in the school year, a little optimism, but also wishing people well as you know, coming back to school and, and getting ready for the school year and, and working with students. And so I'm looking forward to that. I, I think the other piece too is 
as I mentioned, is putting that strategic plan to put into work and, and start working, bringing those things to fruition. You know, that's as once the board approved it, that's the promise that we have to our community and that's what we want to deliver on for our kids. And this year will be the start and it's going to be things that we continue to do over the next several years together. All right, Jeff, that's the time we have. We appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Got it.